Hello, welcome to the Dark Ages podcast, episode 56, The Fall of Italy. Rome belonged to Belisarius. The goth king Vitiges had packed up his besieging force and abandoned their attempt to starve the Romans out of Rome. An expeditionary force led by one of Bel Belisarius's lieutenants had captured Rimini, and the loss of an important city so close to Ravenna spooked Vitiges into burning his camp and retreating back over the mountains. Along the way, he strengthened garrisons, leaving 500 to 2,000 men in towns and fortresses all along the Salarian Way. If Belisarius celebrated his successful defense of the city, Procopius doesn't mention it. The war wasn't over yet. Belisarius set about with workmanlike resolve to ply, play his new hand as well as he had played his last. The capture of Rimini was strategically a good thing, but personally an irritation for Belisarius. He had specifically ordered John not to leave enemy strong points in his rear, and John had gone ahead and left half a dozen such points between himself and Belisarius' main force. Belisarius dispatched a force of a thousand men to ride along the Flaminian Way, parallel to, but out of sight of Vitiges' force, to reach Rimini and carry instructions along with reinforcements. Simultaneously, a force of foot soldiers was sent from Ancona, which was just down the coast from Rimini. Both forces reached their destination well in advance of the arrival of the Goths. The instructions John received were to withdraw his own, mainly cavalry, force from the city and return to the main army in Rome. The infantry force would take their place with a lower-ranking officer in command. The hope was that Vitiges might ignore a less impressive but still strong force that did not so immediately threaten Ravenna and not attempt to retake Rimini. Failing that, infantrymen would place less strain on the city's supplies, as they did not have the same need for livestock fodder that cavalry did. John refused this order, point blank. He had taken Rimini, he would hold Rimini, and neither the Goths nor the great Belisarius were going to pry it away from him. Once again, Belisarius' management problems seemed to have been coming into play. There wasn't much time for remonstration, though, as Vitiges and his still much larger force approached. As the senior officer on site, John ordered the newly arrived reinforcements to defend a nearby town, and hunkered down in Rimini with his own men, preparing for the Goths' inevitable assault. Procopius names the nearby town as Damianus, by the way, which I think is modern San Marino, the fifth smallest country in the world. Actually, if you'd forgive a brief digression while I address nomenclature, if you've been with me for a while, you know that I tend to use the modern name for towns and settlements whenever I can, though obviously the primary sources use different names. I'm actually a little bit old-fashioned in this approach, it seems, but I do it to make the story easier to follow if you decide you'd like to match things to your Google map or whatever. That system breaks down quickly in the eastern half of the empire and in Africa, though. For example, I am not sure that I've mentioned the modern town of Anaba, Algeria at all, but I have mentioned Hippo Regius a bunch of times, which is the same spot. That's partly down to Eurocentrism of most of our educations. We're all just more familiar with the map of Europe at baseline than we are with maps of Turkey or North Africa, and it's not my job to teach you the geography of North Africa. It's my job to tell a story that you can follow. But there is also the fact that many of these are actually different settlements. The Roman town having been destroyed at some point in its history and refounded on the same or similar spot by a different ethnic or linguistic group. The great Roman capital of Sirmium is a great example. It was conquered and completely destroyed by the Avars in 582. Um, spoilers, I guess. And today its ruins lie near Sremska Mitrovica west of Belgrade. If I were to constantly refer to Sremska Mitrovica in the narrative, it would be meaningless to most of you and also be inaccurate since there's no continuity between ancient Sermium to the modern town. The country, Serbia, by the way, does not owe its name to the superficially similar city name, by the way. The origins of the term Serb for the Slavic tribe is mysterious, but was attached to them before they arrived in the region. Since we've now entered the mire of nesting digressions, I think it's time to dig myself out and move on. Uh, where the heck was I? Right, Rimini. It would be so much easier to take sides in the ensuing battle of wills if John were incompetent or foolish, but, alas, his defense of Rimini was active, courageous, and well-executed. 
The Goths attempted the siege tower thing again, this time putting men inside the tower to move it rather than ox teams on the outside. John and his men snuck out in the night and dug a trench to prevent it from reaching the walls, and once it became stuck in this pit, launched a sally out from the gate and set it on fire. At that point, Vitiges gave up direct action and settled on, on starving Rimini out. Unlike Rome, Rimini was small enough to effectively surround and had not been prepared for a prolonged siege. Their supplies were limited, and in spite of his skills and bravery, John couldn't hold out forever. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, where does that come from? Belisarius was being pulled in several directions. A faction within his staff was advocating a relief force to go and relieve Remini, which the general resisted. John had gotten himself into that mess all by himself by ignoring his orders. That the fall of Remini had at least been one of the factors in the Goths abandoning the siege of Rome was conveniently forgotten for the moment. Belisarius was also receiving delegations from cities all over Italy seeking to throw off their Gothic rulers and asking for imperial garrisons to take their place. Most notable was the request from Milan, the old capital of the empire. Feeling that here was a request that couldn't be ignored, Belisarius dispatched a thousand men by ship. Commanded by one Mundulus, they landed at Genoa and from there crossed over the mountains into the fertile Po Valley. They were met by a Gothic army outside Pavia and defeated them, but were unable to take the city itself. Instead, they passed it by on the way to Milan, where they turfed out the Gothic leadership with the cooperation of the locals. Quickly, the other settlements of the Piedmont, especially Novara, Bergamo, and Como, requested their own garrisons, and Mundelaz didn't feel like he was in a position to refuse. Before long, he was left with only about 300 men to defend Milan, which, as you might have guessed, was not ideal and the Milanese, like the Romans before them, found themselves unhappily pressed into service to supplement the imperial troops. The Roman position in the north was tenuous, and would only get worse. Belisarius was finally forced to move in support of John by news that a reinforcing army of 5,000 men had arrived from Constantinople, on the Adriatic side, in Picenum, a region which is now mostly the Italian region of Marche. Lovely, reinforcements are always welcome, surely. But this particular worm had a hook in it, in the form of the army's commander, Narses. We've met Narses before. If you cast your mind back to the Nika riots and the people surrounding Justinian as the crisis mounted, there was Theodora, the empress, Belisarius and Mundus, R.I.P., the generals, and Narses, the eunuch. Narses had been the one who slipped out of the palace to grease the palms of the blues and remove them from the board before the final massacre. Going further back, it would have been Narses who had delivered bribes to the right people to ensure that Justin ended up on the throne, and thereafter, Justinian, when Anthemius had died without an obvious heir. Now pushing 60, Narses was still an operator and still active, and still favored and trusted by Justinian. If he didn't already know about the discontent within Belisarius' officer corps, it didn't take him long to catch the scent of it and it would have been counter to his nature not to try and take advantage. Narses advocated quick and direct intervention to relieve Remini. Belisarius resisted until a letter from John made it through, detailing exactly how close the city was to capitulation. In the face of that information, Belisarius was forced to concede and move directly in support of John. He divided his army into three columns, one to swing wide and approach Remini from the northwest, one to march directly from the south, and one to approach by sea. It was a brilliant bit of positioning, which threatened to completely surround Vitiges' army. Vitiges received news of these movements and the arrival of the imperial reinforcements, and quickly broke off the siege before he could be trapped. He withdrew to Ravenna, his prestige damaged by two humiliating retreats in a row. When the Romans arrived before the walls of Rimini, John rode out and enthusiastically expressed his gratitude. To Narses. He wasn't the only general who was changing his allegiance to Narses. Though Belisarius was still in official control of the war effort, an opposing faction began to coalesce around the eunuch. Strategy meetings became contentious, and the war was far from over. The main Gothic force still remained at Ravenna, and Milan and the other cities of the northwest were scantily defended and in grave danger. Probably worst of all, in Belisarius' mind, their speedy rescue of Remini had left those enemy strongholds in their rear still. Notably, Ancona, which had just recently fallen thanks to the incompetence of its commander, as well as Osimo and Urbino. Belisarius favored sending re reinforcements to Milan, and then turning and dealing with these Gothic strongpoints. Narses advocated a more diffuse approach, 
namely attacking Emilia along the south side of the Po to isolate and put pressure on Ravenna. For the moment, Belisarius was able to enforce his will and all marched south to Urbino, but the divisions between the commanders were clear. The two factions camped separately, and before long Narses declared that Urbino could not be taken, took his men, and withdrew back to Rimini. From there, he put his own plan into action and dispatched troops to spread out across Emilia and secure the towns there. To justify this obvious insubordination, Narses was using a phrase found in the orders that had dispatched him to Italy. Narses had officially been sent as the purser of the imperial forces, not their commander. Justinian had written, It is our wish that Belisarius alone shall lead the whole army as seems good to him, and it behooves you all to obey him in the interest of the state. In the interest of the state. Narses spun Belisarius' initial reluctance to rescue John as a personal vendetta. He argued that Belisarius was allowing personal feelings to dictate strategy and tactics rather than doing what was good for the empire. It's a stretch, really, since the wording to me suggests a simple exhortation to obedience and nothing more. Though others with better qualifications than I have pointed out that obedience to a commander's will should be assumed without such exhortation, and suggest that Justinian placed the phrase there for exactly the use Narses put it to. I suppose you pays your money and you takes your choice. But Belisarius's struggles to maintain the discipline of his officers, whatever their source, had prepared the ground for these seeds, and the crops of dissension were quick to grow. Belisarius was a good general, but not a very wise politician, and was utterly outmatched by Narses, with his thirty-odd years of experience in politics that were literally Byzantine. John was successful in his campaigns, and most of Emilia was quickly in imperial hands, but Belisarius had some good luck too, and the spring that supplied Urbino with water suddenly ran dry, and the garrison was forced to surrender. Belisarius turned his attention to Orvieto, another city on his list. Meanwhile, Vitiges was not idle. He had sent a force commanded by his nephew to smash the tiny garrisons of Milan and its satellite cities. But, I hear you say, because you have excellent memories, wasn't the emperor in contact with the king of the Franks, who had promised to help in the reconquest? Why haven't they come in to play? And I say yes indeed, listener, with an extraordinarily good memory. Thank you for making this awkward segue possible. Yes, Justinian had sent letters and gifts to Theodobert, the king of the Franks of Austrasia, and received promises of material support in return. Don't worry about what Austrasia is, we'll get to it in a later episode. Since hostilities had begun, Justinian had received several letters from Theodobert filled with apologies and explanations for the notable absence of any Frankish aid other than a few threatening gestures along the Alpine borders. Theodobert, in the proud tradition laid down by his grandfather Clovis, was another operator. War in the service of the empire may come with some rewards, but they would be rewards determined by the imperial commanders. There wasn't much more juice to be squeezed from that fruit. But Theodobert still enjoyed the favor of the emperor, and it would be a shame to throw that away, especially when there were other options. Theodobert's realm extended over the Rhine into old Alamanni territory and south into Burgundian territory. So Theodobert sent a large army, 10,000 strong, according to J.B. Burry, to join the Gothic army set to retake Milan and the Piedmont, or at least grab as many shiny goodies as they could get their hands on. If Justinian protested, Theodobert could hold up his head and point out that the army contained no Franks, but they were all Burgundians, and he had no control over them. None whatsoever. Nope, nope, nope. Couldn't have been me. Wasn't even there at the time. The combined Gothic and Burgundian force descended into the Piedmont and helped themselves to anything that wasn't nailed down, before surrounding Milan, Mundulus, and his 300 hapless defenders. The imperial response quickly descended into farce. Belisarius sent a large force to relieve Milan under the command of two men named Martin and Uliaris. Given the number of men available to Belisarius at this time, this large force could not have numbered more than three to 4,000 men. When they drew closer to Milan and understood the number of the enemy, this relief army paused, camped on the southern safe side of the Po River, and dithered. Gold metal levels of dithering. Dithering to beat the band. After enough dithering had taken place that the word treason started to become more appropriate, the commanders sent word to Belisarius that they were terribly outnumbered and unable to cope, and requested that John break off his operations in Amelia to come and reinforce them. Belisarius agreed, but neither John nor his co-commander, Justin, 
would do so much as shake a rein without orders from Narses, and so Milan suffered as letters made their way back and forth across the plains of the Po. Narses did eventually give John permission to go and join Martin and Uliaris, but a further delay arose as John struggled to gather enough boats to cross the river, before falling ill and further delaying the march westward. Meanwhile, Mundelas in Milan received messages from the Goths, who promised that all of his men would be spared if he surrendered the city. Mundelas, who seems to have been a decent enough man, sought the same consideration for the citizens of the city, but the Goths refused to make that promise. The citizens of Milan were traitors, as were the citizens of every city that had opened their gates to the emperor's armies, and traitors had to be dealt with. Mundelez refused to surrender under such terms, but his soldiers were less high-minded, and at last forced their commander to agree to the Goth's terms and save their own skins. At the end of March, 539, Mundelez and his men marched out of Milan into well-treated captivity. Behind them, the wrath of the Ostrogoths fell on the citizens of Milan. I have found it difficult to find much modern work on the ensuing massacre. Procopius tells us that every male citizen was killed, every woman enslaved, and places the death toll at 300,000, which cannot possibly be correct, though the number itself isn't really important in the face of the certain fact of the city's destruction. The chronicler slash bishop Marius of Aventicum wrote with typical class concern that Milan was breached by the Goths and Burgundians, and there were senators with the rest of the people, slain even in the most sacred places, so that the very altars were stained with their blood. In the aftermath, the rest of Liguria and the Piedmont fell back under Ostrogothic control. Martin and Uliaris returned to Belisarius, who refused to see them. Uliaris disappears from history at this point, but Martin went on to later commands in the east, with mixed results. News of the disaster was carried to Justinian by refugee survivors of it. A frank letter of explanation from Belisarius arrived around the same time, and convinced Justinian that divided command in Italy was a mistake. He recalled Narses and recapitulated Belisarius's position of supreme commander. No further punishment was leveled on any military figure for their failures that had led to the destruction of Italy's second largest city. The massacre is a blot on the historical reputation of the Ostrogoths. J.B. Burry, writing in the 1920s and seeing events in racial terms, says it gives us a true measure of the instincts of the Ostrogoths and proclaims it an act of hideous slaughter more savage than any of those of Attila. I am on record that I think that comparing one hideous slaughter to another is an exercise in futility at best, and whataboutism at worst, but the destruction of Milan is symptomatic of the increasing intensity of the Empire's war in Italy. Belisarius was reaching into the heartlands of the Ostrogothic kingdom now, so it's not surprising that the fighting became harder and more brutal. As always, the real victims of this intensification were the ordinary people and the economy of the lands the war touched. Both the destruction of Milan and John's ongoing campaign in Amelia were devastating, and interrupted harvests, which led to shortages and inflation. Gradually, the shortages became famine, and as the year wore on, the situation worsened. Liguria, Etruria, Emilia, and Picenum all suffered famine, and Procopius reports 50,000 deaths in Picenum alone. The imperial armies were well supplied by sea, but all around them, desperation spread. Procopius describes the suffering with his novelist's eye, and his enthusiasm for both the war and its commander begins to noticeably dim. Now as the time went on, and brought again the summer season, the grain was ripening uncared for in the corn lands, but in no such quantities as formerly. Indeed, it was much less. The natural result of this was that most of the people fell victim to all manner of diseases, and it was only a few who threw these off and recovered. I shall tell of the appearance which they came to have, and in what manner they died, for I was an eyewitness. All of them first became lean and pale, for their flesh, being ill-supplied with nourishment, laid hold upon itself, and the bile, having now the mastery of their bodies, lent them almost its own appearance. All moisture left them, and the skin became so dry that it resembled leather more than anything else, giving the appearance of having been fastened on to their bones. And as they changed from a livid to a black color, they came to resemble torches thoroughly burned. Their faces always wore an expression of amazement, while they always had a dreadful kind of insane stare. 
Most of the people were so overcome by their hunger that if they happened upon a bit of grass anywhere, they would rush to it with great eagerness, and kneeling down would try to pull it from the ground. Then, finding themselves unable to do so because all strength had left them, they would fall upon the grass and die. And no one ever laid them in the earth, for there was no one to concern himself with burying them. And yet they remained untouched by any of the birds, for they offered nothing which the birds craved, all the flesh having been consumed by starvation. The Franks weren't the only ones that Vitiges had contacted for help in his time of trouble. While still in Ravenna, dreading the seemingly inevitable approach of Belisarius, he sent messages out again to the Lombards, who demurred, and most boldly of all, to Crusro, the king of Persia. Now, there is no way to send a message from Ravenna to Tessaphon without crossing imperial territory, so Vitiges recruited two Italian priests who could travel without suspicion to carry his message. Given the travel was dangerous in itself, and not to mention the punishment they could expect if they were caught, Vitiges must have been extremely generous in his recruitment package. These men left while the status of Milan was still in doubt, and did manage to arrive safely at the court of the Shahan Shah. Khusro had signed a treaty of eternal peace with Justinian in 532. Since then, he had been irritated by shenanigans of Roman clients along his borders, most especially the Ghassanid Arabs. More importantly, though, he was reaching the end of a period of government reform, reform for which he had needed peace. Now he was beginning to think that a war might be helpful in tamping down some of the discontent that the reform had engendered. When the priests arrived in his court with their letter from Vitiges, Kusro was ready to listen and to be convinced. He began to make preparations to break the truce. News of contact between East and West could not stay secret for long and reached Justinian probably in June of 539. The Italian project was incomplete but could still reasonably be declared a success. Rome was in the hands of its rightful rulers, after all, and the continued presence of the Ostrogoths was a minor annoyance compared to the threat posed by a belligerent Persia. Justinian began to make decisions with an eye to ending the war. He released the Gothic ambassadors he had been holding since the beginning of hostilities, and sent his own ambassadors to begin to work out a compromise settlement. Like many soldiers before and since, Belisarius took a dim view of politicians negotiating away his victory. When Justinian's ambassadors arrived, he refused to allow them to proceed to Ravenna, insisting that first Vitiges release Peter and the other emissaries that Theoda had had seized when all of this began. They had been held in captivity for four years now. As negotiations began, Belisarius continued the work of capturing cities, spending the summer and most of the autumn on Osimo and Fiesole. He had placed Martin and John in a covering position in Tortona to protect against some southward push by the Goths, but they met an unexpected enemy instead. Theodobert the Frank had decided that it wasn't right that only his Burgundian subjects should have all the fun, and led his own army into Italy. All pretense was dropped. It was a Frankish army led by a Frankish king against the forces of the emperor. The reported size of this host is a ludicrous 100,000, I, but I think it's enough to say that it was a lot. The Goths believed that they had come as allies as before, but after they had helped the Franks cross the Po, the Franks turned on them, killing and enslaving the women and children and throwing the dead into the river. A Gothic army that was preparing to challenge Martin and John outside Tortona shouted a welcome to these men that they thought were their allies and received a shower of hand axes in return. We talked about the Francesca, the throwing axe of the Franks, before, and here they are deployed to devastating effect. The Goths broke and fled right through the imperial camp, much to the surprise of its occupants. Thinking that Belisarius must have arrived unexpectedly and defeated the Goths, Martin and John rode to meet him and met the Franks instead. Forced to fight, they were routed and sent wheeling back into Tux Tuscany. Forced to fight, they were routed and sent wheeling back into Tuscany. But the Frankish success quickly went sour. There were provisions in the Gothic and Roman camps, but they weren't enough for such a large mass for long. And now the Franks found themselves deep in a devastated landscape. There was no food to be had anywhere. Whatever treasure there had been had been buried or removed by earlier armies. Theodobert's men complained loudly that they had been promised spoils, but this land was a desert. No blood could be squeezed from this stone. Disease broke out, and the Franks were obliged to retreat back over the mountains. 
they may have lost as much as a third of their forces to this adventure. The Frankish interlude had very little effect on the strategic situation. The change came in the fall of 539. Belisarius sat outside Osimo, keeping the garrison tightly bottled up. The Goths managed to bribe an imperial soldier named Bersentius to carry a letter to Ravenna for them, asking for help. He did so in return with encouraging words, but nothing else. The soldier carried a message again, this time informing the Gothic king that Osimo would surrender in five days if no help arrived. Still, no help was forthcoming. The Romans learned of Bersentius's treachery from a captive. Belisarius, though, declined to pass judgment on the man, instead turning him over to his comrades. They burned him alive before the walls. The end came a little later when Fiesole fell, and the prisoners from that city were brought before the walls of Osimo. The Gothic garrison surrendered on the condition that half of the movable goods would go to the Romans and that they could join Belisarius's force. Vitigis's star fell further in the eyes of his people, and coward began to be heard on Gothic lips. At last free to move against Ravenna, Belisarius wasted no time, and the Goths' military position deteriorated quickly. Reinforcements had arrived from Dalmatia, and Belisarius placed them on the north bank of the Po to prevent what few supplies there were from being sent from Liguria to the capital. Rome in command of the sea prevented resupply from elsewhere. Like it had been for Orestes in 476 and for Odoacer in 489, the fortress city of Ravenna was turning into a prison, and would become a tomb if no action was taken. Vitiges received ambassadors from both the Romans and the Franks. The Franks offered to make common cause with the Goths, and Vitiges probably didn't need the reminders of recent treachery that the Roman ambassadors offered, and he sent the Franks away. He wasn't desperate enough to put his head into that wolf's mouth again. His nephew, Aureus, who had captured and destroyed Milan, attempted to come to the rescue with 4,000 men, but the Romans managed to capture the wives and children of many of those soldiers, and they mutinied en masse and joined John and Martin's force. Meanwhile, enemies began to appear inside the walls of Ravenna. Someone set the city's granaries on fire, and it was rumored that the inspiration for that had come from Mata Swintha, Vitigis's unwilling queen and the daughter of Amala Swintha who was in secret communication with Belisarius. The Roman ambassadors carried a proposal that was extremely generous given the military situation. All territory north of the Po would be retained by Vitiges and the Goths. All that south of the river would be in imperial control. Vitiges would remain king and the Goths would pay an indemnity consisting of half of the treasure in Ravenna. And that would be the end of it. Vitiges and his leading men jumped at the opportunity to end the war on such favorable terms and could barely conceal their relief. In spite of some bright spots, the war had been a disaster for the Ostrogoths. To get out of the thing alive at all was a victory. Belisarius, though, was disgusted. He had Vitiges by the throat, and now he was being prevented from squeezing. He refused to sign the treaty when it was presented to him. Some of his generals, still not entirely on their commander's side, grumbled that such was a defiance of the emperor's will. Belisarius called them all together and compelled them to make their support for the treaty clear in writing. They did, unanimously, but Belisarius still refused to sign it. The delay worked on the mind of Vitiges and the other Gothic leaders, who began to suspect that the treaty was merely a tactic and a trap. Technically, Belisarius's signature wasn't necessary to make the treaty binding, but now the Goths required it as a condition of their agreement. Impatience was growing, directed as much at Vitiges as at Belisarius, since his incompetence and inaction had led to this humiliating position. In this atmosphere of suspicion and growing despair, someone had an idea. The Amals were effectively extinct, and Vitiges seemed to have demonstrated that there were no others who could be credible kings of the Ostrogoths. Why not go back to the way things had once been? Why not make themselves servants of an emperor? Not Justinian, who was far away but a revived Western emperor that they could all respect. An emperor Belisarius? The Ostrogoths would proclaim him their emperor and serve him loyally. When word of this plan made its way to Vitiges, he reluctantly agreed that he would step aside in favor of his opponent, who in spite of everything had always behaved with honor and whose military prowess was self-evident. He was probably too exhausted and depressed to do anything else. 
The proposal was passed to Belisarius in secret. The Goths were sure that he would jump at the chance, and he did agree, enthusiastically. And here we have to be cautious of Procopius's narrative. He goes out of his way to make it clear that Belisarius had no intention of following through with this plan, that he had seen a way to make his conquest complete, but would stop short of accepting the imperial diadem. According to our historian, he again convened a council of his commanders and made it absolutely clear that such was his intention. But could Procopius have been polishing the subject a little bit? Is it possible that Belisarius did, at least for a while, consider the idea of being a new Western emperor? I imagine it must have. Alone in his tent at night, he would hardly have been human if he had not. But I also imagine that the implications would have been self-evident with less than a moment's thought. Justinian would never accept or forgive such a betrayal, and rather than ending the war, a new one would start, especially since Belisarius couldn't count on his own commanders going along with the idea. So Belisarius agreed to all the terms that were offered, but demurred to accept the purple, saying he wished to wait until he met with Vitiges and the Gothic lords in person. Agreements apparently in place, Belisarius made preparations to enter the city. He ordered grain ships to supply suffering Ravenna, and sent his least reliable commanders, John among them, on various errands around the country, on the not unreasonable pretext that it would be impossible to provide for a whole army in such a concentrated place. In May of 540, Belisarius entered Ravenna. Procopius, unfortunately, does not describe the moment when he made the deception clear. Vitiges and Matasuentha were taken into honorable captivity. The palace was thoroughly looted, but Ravenna itself was not subject to sack. The Goths who were present were allowed to return to their homes. Most of the towns of the north had already surrendered and accepted Roman garrisons under the false pretense of the agreement. The notable exceptions were Pavia and Verona. Satisfied that he had achieved his ultimate objective, having deposed and captured the kings of both the Vandals and the Ostrogoths, Belisarius sailed for Constantinople. Behind him, he left an Italy that was once again part of the Roman Empire, but also an Italy that had been devastated and impoverished. Urban infrastructure had been destroyed all over the peninsula. Much of it would never be repaired. Agriculture would take decades to fully recover. In Italy, at least, there is an argument that if we are going to use the forbidden phrase, the Dark Ages, they really arrive here and now, ironically, at a moment of supposed restoration. Belisarius also left behind a job not really finished. Vitiges' nephew Eureus in Pavia and another noble named Ildabad in Verona remained unreconciled to the new reality. Kingship was offered to Eureus, but he declined on the basis that his uncle had leached all the legitimacy out of their bloodline. Ildabad allowed himself to be crowned instead, and he was well known as a commander and had some royal connections, as he was a nephew of the king of the Spanish Visigoths. Though his kingdom consisted of only about a thousand fighting men in a strip of territory connecting the two remaining cities, this was a seed from which a revived Gothic polity would grow. Belisarius's return to Constantinople was in stark contrast this time from his return from Africa. Justinian had heard about the imperial offer, and though Belisarius had done the right thing and refused it, it still didn't sit well. By circumventing the negotiated settlement with Vitiges, Belisarius had undermined the emperor's express wish, and that could not be celebrated. The general was received coolly by Justinian and Theodora, and no triumph was celebrated. It would be an overstatement to say that he returned in disgrace, but his star did not shine as bright as it once had. He would be dispatched to the east the following spring to begin operations against the Persians. Vitiges died in Constantinople two years after his arrival. His wife, Matasuentha, the last descendant of Theodoric the Great, married a local patrician and cousin of Justinian named Germanus, who lived just long enough to give her a son, also named Germanus. She lived comfortably in Constantinople as a widow for the rest of her life, and died in 551. There is much more to come for Italy, but since we've spent five episodes now on just this one war, I think it's time to take a breath and look elsewhere for a while. I have decided what I'm going to look at. It'll be another big theme episode, a little bit like the war one. And a little bit like the war one, it is a broad subject that I have picked and will take quite a bit of research to put together. Coupled with the fact that life and family stuff has struck me hard in the last month, 
and I have had much less time and much less brain power for podcasting, which has probably been obvious in the sporadic release dates, I am not sure when that episode will happen. Which just makes it imperative that I thank you all for your support. Thank you to Juiced, who supported on Ko-fi.com slash DarkAgesPod, and to new monthly donators Barchester and Scarlet, who join the ranks of the now inaccurately named Magnificent Seven of Paul, Scott, Jesse, Brendan, Alex, Dusty, and John. Also thank you to everyone who has left comments anywhere that you've left them. I am too far behind on Spotify comments to mention them all today, but do know that I read and appreciate every single one. On Apple Podcasts, thank you to Greg in Australia, Scott in Canada, and to Tallwalker, Jinx, and blah, blah, blah in the U.S. for all of your kind words. Tallwalker, I hope you were not disappointed that the Queen of the Goss format is only going to be an occasional thing that took forever to put together. I will be back as soon as I can with something worth listening to, I promise. So hang tight, all, and take care.